Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today our topic is heteroskedasticity consistent standard errors and the use of them to retrieve heteroskedasticity consistent estimators of significance for your model coefficients. Well, in our previous tutorials, we have investigated how to retrieve the covariance matrix for your estimators, for your parameters, and use it to calculate the standard errors for your estimators and uh, do all of the tests that we usually do without the aid of black box tools that are given by Excel, such as Linus or Data Analysis tab. Today, we're going even deeper, and we'll investigate how to retrieve those standard errors, the t-stats for coefficients, in presence of heteroscedasticity. And that's why they're called robust standard errors. They can allow you to test for significance of coefficients, even under heteroscedasticity. And it's quite commonly known that heteroscedasticity, which is the case where the variance of your error terms across observations are not constant, cannot be assumed constant, and that, due to the Gauss-Markov theorem, affects the efficiency of your estimators. The standard errors can be not precisely estimated using the conventional algorithms. So we'll compare the two algorithms, the non-robust and the robust, and see how we can calculate standard errors and t-stats using the usual approaches. And our example today is to study the dynamics of economic growth, GDP per capita growth in 2019, in a sample of 131 countries, using some plausible candidate variables obtained from world development indicators. So our variables are log GDP per capita that tests for convergence, whether poor countries grow faster than rich countries, so they're catching up, gross capital formation, FDI inflation, and government spending. So quite commonly used uh, regresses in such studies. And uh, just to recap, we have just calculated the estimators, the coefficients for our five explanatory variables plus the constant using this particular matrix multiplication formula over here. And uh, we have, in our previous video, also touched upon how to retrieve the F statistic, the explained squared sum, the residual squared sum, and the R squared to test the significance of the whole model. But how to approach testing the significance of individual coefficients, especially subject to heteroscedasticity, or make these tests, these statistics, heteroscedasticity consistent. Because obviously, the economic growth in some countries can be more volatile, more unpredictable than in others. There are very stable countries, such as perhaps United States, Australia, European countries, and there are countries that grow uh, in a quite volatile way that are resource-oriented, for example, and economic growth there could be very much affected by raw materials prices, and so on and so forth. So you get the logic. Let's make our model robust to heteroscedasticity. But first, let's recap how to calculate our covariance matrix and standard errors without the heteroscedasticity adjustment. And this is actually quite easy. This formula for the covariance matrix just requires you to calculate the inverse of the product of the transposed matrix of X and the non-transposed matrix of X, and multiply it by the variance, by the uh, squared uh, standard error of the regression model. And we have calculated it here, and just to recap, it's just the sum squared of your error term divided by the number of the degrees of freedom, and the square root is taken from this expression as well. So actually, we can calculate our matrix over here, and that would be a 6 by 6 matrix, as we have got 6 coefficients, and the covariance matrix gives you the variances of all coefficients at the diagonal, and covariances between different coefficients uh, at non-diagonal elements. So again, we can just use the M inverse function and apply it to a matrix multiplication of the transposed X, so the transposed matrix with six columns, the constant, and five explanatory variables, and we multiply it on the right by non-transposed matrix of X, copying it for brevity over here. And then we can just multiply this uh, inverse matrix, as required by this formula, by the standard error of the regression model squared. And we can enforce this using shift control enter. 
and get our covariance matrix. And now the squares of our standard errors for the coefficients are available at the diagonal over here. So we can actually calculate those by just taking square roots of the diagonal elements. And then, first of all, we can drag it down and then edit it so it is indeed the diagonal. So we can just increase the column identificators here, just like that, and get standard errors that do exactly match the ones that we can retrieve from the Linus template over here. So that's reassuring. Linus gives you non-robust, non heteroscedistic consistent standard errors, which is quite obvious. And now we can convert our coefficient and our standard error into tstat, just dividing them, and then we can retrieve p-values to test for the significance of individual coefficients using the two-tailed t distribution, inputting the absolute value of our t statistic and the number of the degrees of freedom available over here, which is just the number of observations in our sample minus the number of restrictions that we have imposed, so the number of coefficients in our model. And we see that we have got three significant determinants of economic growth in our sample countries, which are log GDP per capita. It's indeed the case, at least in our non-robust estimation, that richer countries grow slower than poorer countries. And we also see that inflation affects growth uh, negatively. This is negative and significant at 10%, but the most significant determinant is gross, gross capital formation. So investment does lead to faster economic growth, and that is significant at 1%. That is the most significant of all of our coefficients. While the constant, FDI and government spending are insignificant in our estimation. But is that affected by the violations of gauss markov theorem in terms of homoscedasticity? Maybe, uh, as our economic growth variables are heteroscedastic, that is, they have different variances across different observations, our estimators of standard errors or variances of coefficients are inefficient and we have rejected or have not rejected the null hypothesis of insignificance of the parameters unjustly. So to do that, we got to calculate the heteroscedasticity consistent estimator of the covariance matrix and apply the same procedure to that over here. So to calculate the uh, estimator of a heteroscedasticity consistent covariance matrix, we have to implement this formula, which is quite a bit bulkier, but quite intuitive if you look into that. This formula is quite affectionately called by econometricians the sandwich estimator, because we have got a sandwich going on with two pieces of bread, which is um, just the usual inverse of the product of transposed x and x, and we encounter it multiple times in our previous regression formulas in the um, non-robust covariance matrix and also in the estimator of coefficients themselves. But the meat of our sandwich is this expression over here. That is a non-inverse product of the weight matrix, so we weight it uh, to account for heteroscedasticity somehow, and we'll touch upon that a little bit later, and we multiply it on the left by the transposed x and on the right by a non-transposed x. And this bulky matrix multiplication gives you the heteroscedasticity consistent covariance matrix. So what is that weight matrix? In the simplest sandwich estimator that was derived by Huber and White in the 1980s, this weight matrix is just the estimated uh, squared errors across all observations. So we would have a 131 by 131 ma weight matrix that are just error variances that we can calculate from our residuals over here. So with these errors, and we'll square them and get them on the diagonal of our weight matrix and fill all other elements of our weight matrix with zeros. So let's do just that. Let's code our weight matrix below over here. And that's indeed 131 by 131, as we've got 131 observations. And uh, let's use the following formula to fill it in. If our row identificator is the same as our column identificator over here, then we need to input the squared residual for a particular observation. So we can lock the column here, but not the row, and square it. And uh, if we're not on the diagonal, then we'll just return zero, because this matrix should be diagonal in the heteroscedasticity consistent case. And then we can fill it in just using control right, and then bottom right click it all the way down, and we get our 
matrix of weights, matrix of individual error variances. And now we can actually already calculate our bulky sandwich estimator of the covariance matrix, that is Hedriska's statistic consistent. And to save us some time, we can just copy the formula for the M inverse of XT times X and build upon that. So first of all, we get our M inverse. Then we need to multiply it on the right by another matrix multiplication, so M mult. First, we input the transposed X over here. And then we input another matrix multiplication that has the weight matrix or the individual error variance matrix multiplied on the right by our X matrix, non-transposed. And then this matrix multiplication needs to be multiplied on the right again by our usual suspect M inverse of XT over X. So we can just do uh, M mult and here input another minverse that we handily have got over here. And then we can close the bracket and enforce this formula using shift control enter and get our heteroscedistic consistent covariance matrix. And the diagonal elements, as in the previous case, would give you the variances of your coefficients. And that's exactly what we need to get our heteroscedistic statistic consistent standard errors. And we just calculate square roots of the diagonal elements and apply exactly the same procedure, bottom right clicking it and then adjusting it to reflect the diagonal elements. And then we can calculate the t-stats, again dividing the coefficients by the respective standard errors. Quite notably, the estimators themselves do not change in the heteroscedistic statistic consistent case, only the standard errors do change because heteroscedisticity, as in Gauss-Markov theorem, does not lead to biased estimators, it leads to inefficient estimators, and that is what this procedure reflects. And then we can finally get our p-values. So two-tailed t-distribution, absolute value of the respective t-stat, and the degrees of freedom over here. And we can see that if we adjust for heteroscedisticity, we have got another picture emerging. We have got our log GDP per capita turning insignificant in comparison to the prior estimation when we were having a non-robust covariance matrix, so convergence is not as notable as we initially expected. The constant becomes significant, that has little interpretative value in that case. And most importantly, inflation becomes the most significant determinant of economic growth in this setting, with this standard error being much lower, this t-stat, on the other hand, becoming much higher in terms of magnitude, and this p-value going below 1%, making this result significant at 1%. And gross capital formation still remains quite significant, even in the robust case. However, here in our estimations of the um, individual errors in the error variance matrix or our weight matrix, we haven't adjusted by the number of the degrees of freedom. Most commonly, for additional robustness in your robust estimations, non -pun in, no pun intended, we got to adjust by the number of the degrees of freedom in our model. And we can do that by just multiplying our variances by the number of observations and dividing it by the number of the degrees of freedom. That would inflate the variances by the uh, ratio of n and n minus k, basically, and that would penalize your model if it includes too many variables leading to degree of freedom reduction. And that is more common to encounter this approach in academic literature. So let's compare the results with the non-adjusted and the adjusted values. However, they would not change much as our degrees of freedom reduction is not that massive. But regardless, we can populate our matrix with our new formula that adjusts for the degree of freedom reduction. And we see that the p-values have increased a little bit, but not by much, leaving exactly the same coefficients significant. And that's all there is in terms of heteroscedistic consistent standard errors and the heteroscedistic consistent covariance matrix estimated using the sandwich formula as in Huber and White. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.